uh, surgical intervention, just being a patient in the ICU can be very uncomfortable uh, for all of the things that we do on a, on a normal basis. This includes phlebotomy, inserting central lines, nasogastric and urinary catheters, oral care and eye care, uh, the presence of an endotracheal tube and being on a mechanical ventilator, prolonged immobilities uh, associated with significantly increased pain, and then things like repositioning and mobilization for a patient who's been immobilized uh, can be very uncomfortable. All of these physical sources of pain are exacerbated by psychosocial disorders. We're at high risk of, of patients having this problem. The question then is how do we recognize it? And so when we think about pain assessment, uh, th there are a number of different options that are, that are available. When possible, self-reporting is really optimal. Uh, for patients, whether they're intubated or not, being able to ask them, are you in pain? Uh, are you suffering? If the patient is able to tell me, yes, this hurts, then that's a very clear indicator that they need, uh, need more analgesia. Um, we tend to use a zero to 10 scale. Um, this has been well validated and is often feasible. When that's not feasible, something like a, uh, a visual scale of smiling faces to frowning faces can be a way for patients to, to, um, to explain. It can be very helpful as a patient is early in their critical illness to help to explain those, those metrics and orient them to that, that pain reporting system. So you know, if you can have a discussion with the patient before they're intubated about how we'll be monitoring their pain while they're on a mechanical ventilator or before a major operation um, so that they're familiar with those, those systems because if a patient is uh, sedated subsequently or uh, has an element of delirium developing, that can make it much more difficult to explain that system to them. When a patient is not able to self-report, there's uh, several validated and re reliable uh, objective tools, um, including the behavioral pain scale and the critical care pain observation tool. Those, those objective uh, observed scores can be uh, uh, helpfully uh, supplemented by family input when family members or people who know the patient are, are present to the bedside. Uh, they're often much better attuned to find cues like restlessness and grimacing. Um, they, they can help us to get a sense that the patient is uncomfortable when they're not able to self-report. Lastly, I would mention that um, it's a, it's a dangerous practice to rely on vital signs as an indicator of pain. The fact that a patient's becoming more tachycardic or more hypertensive should definitely trigger further assessment, but we should not treat all tachycardia with, with analgesics. And there, there are a number of other etiologies of vital sign abnormalities uh, that should be on our differential as well. So I mentioned the behavioral pain scale. Uh, this is a, a snapshot of what that scale looks like. So you're looking at the patient's facial expression, upper extremity movements, and their compliance with the ventilator. So if a patient is relaxed, not moving their arms, uh, and tolerating mechanical ventilation and repositioning without difficulty, that would be a very low pain scale. So if somebody's grimacing, uh, has their arms flexed up in a defensive posture, and is uh, fighting or synchronous with the ventilator, um, those would all be markers to say that the patient has inadequately treated pain. So once we've been able to identify pain, then the question is, how do we treat it? Uh, there are a number of, of options available to us. Uh, the one that we rely on most heavily in the United States is opioid pain medication. And in, in most contexts, that will probably still be the mainstay of ICU analgesia, um, but should not be the only medication in your regimen. There are several great studies showing that acetaminophen either enterally or intravenously, or, or paracetamol, if that's the uh, nomenclature that, that you're more familiar with, is very effective in decreasing the requirement for opioids and can be a, a, an important adjunct. NSAIDs are also very effective in, in uh, supplementing opioid use and decreasing patients' opioid requirement. Uh, we know that uh, in high doses and for a prolonged time, NSAIDs increase the risk of uh, uh, ulcer formation, uh, gastric ulcer formation, um, and can cause renal impairment. And so instead of continuous NSAID use for a prolonged time, uh, really we think about NSAIDs especially for procedural use 
or in the immediate post-operative period, maybe for uh, 24 to 48 hours, uh, but should not be a, an ongoing long-term medication because of those risks. Low-dose ketamine, and we're talking about one or two mics per kilo per minute, um, so it's sub-dissociative dosing, can be a, uh, another useful and data-supported adjunct to opioids. And then for neuropathic pain specifically, gabapentinoids can be, can be helpful. Um, although with gabapentinoids, there is a risk of increased sedation. They may contribute to delirium. And for non-neuropathic pain, they're less likely to be effective. There's been a lot of research around IV lidocaine. Um, that hasn't really borne out in, in our setting to, to be proven to be effective, but there's still some ongoing research about whether or not that may be a useful adjunct. Uh, and then if nefapam is available where you practice, uh, there's some very uh, uh, convincing studies about using nefapam as an opioid um, adjunct. Uh, it's not FDA approved, and so it's not something that we have a lot of experience with in the United States, which I think is, is unfortunate. And then finally, maybe most importantly to think about are non-pharmacologic interventions. So things like ice packs, massage, music therapy, these are things that are readily available and uh, very inexpensive and are also well supported by, by research as uh, important adjuncts to, to opioids uh, in a multimodal analgesic regimen. So with all those considerations together, um, the PADIS guidelines recommend really making sure that you have adequate analgesia before you start uh, sedation. You don't want to be treating a patient's pain with sedatives because that's going to increase their sedation needs and not really effectively target the pathways that are causing the, the pain. Um, and it's important to distinguish between analgesia before sedation and analgesia as sedation. So you aren't using opioids as a sedative. And I think it's really helpful to keep sedation and analgesia separated as two, two distinct problems in your, in your mind. And so using either a self-reported pain scale or a, an objective measure like the behavioral pain scale, make sure that your patient's pain is under control. And then once they, they are adequately, uh, have their pain adequately controlled, then think about if they still have agitation that's requiring sedation um, and think about using a second agent for that. Uh, the PADIS guidelines recommend an assessment-driven protocol-based stepwise approach like we discussed and note that that results in better pain control shorter duration of mechanical ventilation and shorter ICU lengths of stay, lower mortality and less need for sedation, opioids, and, and as a result, less uh, adverse drug events. Other recommendations are using some of those adjuncts that we discussed to minimize opioids, given the association with depressed mental status, respiratory depression, ileus, uh, hyperanalgesia, and hyperalgesia and uh, the risk for chronic dependence in ICU patients, but not to avoid opioids altogether if those are the medications that are needed to maintain pain control for your patients. Um, to consider either enteral or IV routes and to consider whether continuous uh, infusions, scheduled IV boluses or just PRN dosing are most effective depending on your patient's physiology and your practice setting. They note that regimens will differ based on local drug ability and uh, the culture of your institution, the, the practices that your providers and nursing staff are most comfortable with. So how do we adapt this for the COVID era and for low and middle income countries? Well, we know that drug availability and cultural acceptance of opioids can vary widely in low and middle income countries. Uh, we have had to face drug shortages and change our analgesic regimens uh, in the, the early COVID wave that we had in the United States in April, May, and June, and uh, drug shortages were, were a real problem for us to deal with. One way that we addressed that was using less IV infusions and more enteral routes, so giving um, morphine or oxycodone through a feeding tube for mechanically ventilated patients. Um, that makes the titration a little bit more difficult, um, but when you have drug shortages, you know, those uh, adaptations may be necessary. Also bear in mind that specifically patients with COVID-19 are often hypermetabolic with very high analgesic requirements. And so be prepared to give higher doses and uh, more frequent uh, doses of medication than you're used to otherwise. 
Uh, bear in mind that for uh, infection prevention concerns, it's often desirable with COVID-19 patients to minimize the amount of time the patients are in the room or at the bedside. And so uh, IV infusions or frequent bolus dosing may be less, uh, less desirable than otherwise. And having a patient on longer acting analgesic may be a good way to keep your ICU staff safe. Remember that renal dysfunction and hepatic dysfunction are common complications of COVID-19. And so many of these medications that, that we were discussing are either uh, are metabolized through the kidneys and the liver and have risk of either hepatotoxicity or uh, renal toxicity. And so specifically, we worry about hepatotoxicity with overdoses of uh, paracetamol or acetaminophen. We worry about renal toxicity with high doses or prolonged uh, regimens of NSAIDs. Um, and so that's something to be careful for uh, in patients with, with organ dysfunction. Uh, and then finally, as I had mentioned, enteral opioids may be easier to administer um, if you are running short on infusion pumps. It's a way to keep your infusion pumps uh, free for vasoactives um, by, by using enteral opioids instead. But in patients who are critically ill with multi-organ uh, dysfunction, um, gut, gut absorption may be um, irregular, especially in patients who are on higher doses of vasoactives. And so that's going to be a delicate balance to manage. If you're giving a patient enteral opioids and you're unsure that they're uh, really absorbing those, those medications, that might be an indication to think about uh, reconsidering an intravenous route. We're going to move on to agitation. Um, and I'm going to really try to, to tease apart agitation and delirium as two separate issues that we should be thinking about separately in the ICU. So agitation can be either a primary agitation that's due to delirium or a secondary agitation due to one of the many, many common conditions in the intensive care unit, uh, including pain, respiratory distress or discomfort with mechanical ventilation, anxiety, depression, immobility, uh, or difficulty communicating. All of these are things that are very common for patients who are critically ill and mechanically ventilated and are not indications for, for pharmacologic sedation necessarily. We know that sedatives are frequently used for anxiolysis and stress reduction and to facilitate care and prevent self-harm for patients in the ICU. Uh, uh, Dr. Adaranke, if you don't mind uh, muting your, your microphone, I would appreciate it. I think we're getting a little bit of, uh, or if the, if the host is able to, to mute for him, I would appreciate it, or her. Um, we also know that increased amounts of sedation uh, usage are associated with increased mort uh, morbidity for ICU patients. Um, there's a bit, uh, this is an association that doesn't prove causation, but there's good evidence to suggest that minimizing sedation when possible uh, is beneficial for our are critically ill patients. Um, and further, we know that sedated ICU patients are at increased risk for adverse events because of inconsistent drug absorption, pharmacokinetics, and pharmacodynamics. So just as we talked about having an objective measure of pain in the ICU, it's also very important to have an objective measure of agitation. Uh, the one that we use most commonly in my intensive care unit, one of the most uh, commonly used and best uh, validated is the, Richard, uh, the Richmond Agitation and Sedation Scale, or the RAS scale. And this is a scale for minus five in a patient who is unarousable, essentially in a drug-induced coma, to combative, violent, uh, presenting immediate danger to, to staff and self. Um, historically, uh, we often targeted deeper sedation with a RAS of minus three or minus four. So these are patients who might briefly open their eyes to voice but not maintain eye contact or not respond to voice and only move to, to uh, tactile stimulation. Um, and there's really been a shift away from targeting those deeper sedation goals, like a RAS of minus three or minus four, to light sedation. So really a, mass, a RAS of zero to minus one. So this is somebody who's alert and calm, or not fully alert, but able to sustain eye opening and uh, eye contact to voice. Now, there, there are a number of different medications that can be used for treating agitation in the ICU. Uh, probably the three most commonly that we use as continuous infusions would be benzodiazepines, propofol, 
and dexmedetomidine or Presidex. Um, all of those have uh, upsides and downsides with them. Benzodiazepines we know uh, are at especially high risk of accumulating and having uh, resulting in prolonged weaning. Benzodiazepines are also uh, associated with increased delirium compared with propofol or dexmedetomidine. Propofol uh, is, is very effective and short acting, so it's a medication that you can turn off quickly. Uh, but we know that it's associated with a significant risk of hypotension. Often patients uh, who were, were hemodynamically normal and uvolemic before a propofol infusion will need a little bit of vasoactive support to, to prevent the, uh, to counteract the vasoplegia with propofol. Uh, propofol also uh, is associated with a, a high lipid load. Um, and so it's important to manage, uh, to monitor triglycerides in patients on propofol infusions. They're at risk of uh, hyperlipidemia that can even result in significant pancreatitis. And then propofol infusion syndrome is a very uh, 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 clinically significant, uh, can be catastrophic event in patients who've been on high dose propofol infusions for, for longer periods of time, more than a couple of days. Um, and so monitoring for rhabdomyolysis, uh, organ dysfunction, um, and hyperlipidemia can be very, are, are very important patients who are on uh, high doses of propofol for, for more than a few days. Dexmedetomidine um, is more hemodynamically neutral in terms of blood pressure, but can be uh, associated with dramatic bradycardia. Um, it's also a very expensive medication, and in patients who've been on high doses of dexmedetomidine for a prolonged time, um, they can develop withdrawal with rapid cessation. And so often, uh, in patients who've been on dexmedetomidine for, for many days or weeks, um, those patients will require a clonidine uh, taper to help to, to wean off um, as, they're, as they're recovering. Other, other medications that are sometimes used or that we think about, um, antipsychotics like Haldol or Seroquel or what, what, whichever medications you have available to you, um, can be effective for longer term uh, management of agitation um, as you're getting into that window where longer infusions of benzodiazepines um, prof, uh, propofol or dexmedetomidine are ha having increasing uh, adverse uh, effects associated with them. Um, th the major downside with antipsychotics is that these are medications that you can't stop immediately, um, and those are medications that get cleared uh, over a, a much longer period of time. Um, and so when we, we talk a bit in a, in a couple minutes about uh, uh, spontaneous awakening trials, that's really not feasible with patients who are on uh, standing antipsychotics. Um, those medications also can have significant drug interactions, in particular QTC prolongation, um, and so monitoring for QTC prolongation with patients who are on high doses of antipsychotics is very important. Um, ketamine at dissociative doses, so this is about 20 times higher than, than the analgesic dosing of ketamine, um, can also be effective as as a uh, sedating medication um, with some variable impact on the patient's hemodynamic status. Uh, we know that uh, ketamine is an indirect sympathomimetic, um, but a direct myocardial depressant. So depending on your patient's physiology, um, often we see a little bit of uh, increased tachycardia and hypertension with ketamine, but, but not always. Um, opioids can have a sedating effect, but again, because of the adverse effects in terms of ileus and, uh, and delirium with opioids and significant constipation with high doses of opioids, really don't recommend using op opioids as a primary anxiolytic, although sometimes you, that is a secondary effect that you will see with them. Um, and then anticholinergic medications like um, uh, di diphenhydramine do have some uh, anxiolytic effect that are associated with significantly increased delirium. So really not a, an advisable um, anxiolytic to be using in the ICU. And then finally, I think it's important to bear in mind, not all patients who are critically or, or mechanically ventilated have agitation that requires anxiolysis. And so for patients who have a RAS score of, of zero with, without medications, then those patients don't require uh, anxiolytic infusions just because they are critically ill or mechanically ventilated. 
Um, and sometimes uh, behavioral interventions, uh, having a conversation with the patient, keeping them oriented, keeping them informed on what's going on with their care uh, can be sufficient so the patients don't require uh, more pharmacologic interventions. Uh, so this is a study from the Blue Journal from about uh, six years ago, uh, comparing propofol with benzodiazepines in the ICU. It's a little bit of a, a, a busy set of tables or of diagrams. Uh, but this was a retrospective review comparing propofol with either midazolam with the uh, diagram on the left or lorazepam with the diagram on the right. These top sets of curves are showing fewer ventilator days for patients treated with benzodiazepines and set of curves showing lower incidence of death in patients who are treated with propofol versus uh, benzodiazepines. So again, as a recommendation in general for critically ill patients to uh, prefer propofol over benzodiazepines when that's feasible. Uh, the other point that I really want to make, so this is a schematic that's intended to give you a sense of how a patient's medication needs may fluctuate over time. Um, so first of all, hopefully, although not always, patients' degrees of agitation will decrease over time as their clinical status improves, uh, as they become more oriented to the ICU environment, um, and as they're, they're recovering from their critical illness, although that's not always the case. Secondly, their tolerance for medications may increase over time, and so they may need higher and higher doses to achieve the same therapeutic effect, even if their baseline level of agitation is stable or even decreasing. And really, none of this is certain. Agitation may increase with worsening delirium, new pain, or other noxious stimuli. And evolving hepatic or renal dysfunction, as well as other medications that, that affect drug metabolism, can unpredictably change the therapeutic effect of uh, agitation treatments and anxiolytics. So all of this is to say that agitation and agitation treatment are dynamic processes, and it's important to continually reassess and adjust medication regimens throughout a patient's ICU course. One way of doing this is with daily spontaneous awakening trials. These are associated with more ventilator-free days, shorter ICU length of stay, and lower long-term mortality without more self-extubations requiring intubation in mechanically ventilated patients. So this is a diagram showing a, I believe that was 44% uh, mortality in patients who underwent spontaneous awakening trials versus 58 in patients who did not. So significant mortality benefits associated with spontaneous awakening trials. Uh, mechanically ventilated patients are eligible if they're not being sedated because of seizures or alcohol withdrawal, not having escalating sedation requirements because of ongoing agitation, and not undergoing neuromuscular blockade uh, without elevated ICP or MI. You perform a spontaneous awakening trial by stopping all sedating medications. This doesn't mean stopping analgesics. If the patient has pain, you should continue to treat their pain. Um, but pause the sedation and see how the patient does off of sedatives. And um, if the patient fails, instead of restarting at the full dose that they were on previously, restart at half of the dose and then titrate is needed. Patient passes. If they're able to open their eyes to verbal stimuli and is comfortable for over uh, four hours, a patient fails, they're having sustained anxiety, agitation, or pain, tachypnea that's lasting for more than five minutes, hypoxemia, or increasing ventilator requirements, if they develop an arrhythmia, or other evidence of respiratory distress, uh, like tachycardia, bradycardia, accessory muscle use, uh, paradoxical movement of the abdominal wall, diaphoresis, or marked dyspnea. So the PADIS guidelines recommend targeting light sedation over deep sedation uh, because of the associated shorter ventilator times without increased uh, rate of self-extubation and say that this can be achieved either with nursing-driven protocols or with a spontaneous awakening trial protocol. They recommend propofol or dexmedetomidine over benzodiazepines uh, because of those associated longer ventilator times uh, and uh, longer time to achieve sedation goals with benzodiazepines, as well as increased delirium, especially with continuous infusions of benzodiazepines. And then they suggest considering objective monitoring like a BIS monitor for patients who are deeply sedated or with neuromuscular blockade, although the evidence to support this monitoring in 
uh, ICU patients is not robust. Finally, looking at uh, COVID in, in low and middle income countries, um, COVID patients can have severe agitation and dyssynchrony that requires deeper than usual sedation. And so even though a light sedation goal is usually uh, feasible for critically ill patients, sometimes in our ICUs, we are needing to, to target deeper sedation with a RAS goal of minus two, minus three, um, because of the significant dyssynchrony with uh, COVID-19 patients. Um, and also be aware that uh, if patients are uh, is with severe hypoxemic respiratory failure, requiring proning or neurovascular blockade, those patients will often require higher levels of sedation. Um, also understand that patients with severe hypoxemic respiratory failure can be at very high risk of adverse events uh, when they're inadequately sedated. So if a patient is asynchronous with a ventilator or if a patient uh, self-extubates with uh, severe COVID-19 uh, ARDS, that can be a, a fatal event. And so uh, when patients have very severe respiratory failure, uh, again, targeting deeper sedation goals is often advisable. Finally, optimal sedation really requires a highly skilled nursing staff um, and uh, close nursing uh, presence at the bedside, which can be a challenge, especially if your healthcare system is, is being overwhelmed in the context of COVID-19. Um, and so sometimes it's just necessary to target higher sedation goals, uh, both for provider nursing safety and for patient safety. Um, and having protocols to guide sedation uh, for inexperienced teams can be very, very helpful. Again, as, as we talked about drug shortage, shortages with analgesics, also the case with anxiolytics during, uh, during a pandemic. Uh, we talked about minimizing nursing contact at bedside. Um, and considering while having patients on short acting infusions that we're able to pause for a daily spontaneous awakening trial as they're in the convalescent phase of their illness, uh, considering longer acting medications like phenobarbital for patients who are anticipating to have high sedation goals for, for several days going forward uh, is a consideration. And finally, there's been some limited uh, literature case reports about using inhaled anesthetic in the ICU uh, in the face of uh, uh, critical drug shortages. Um, we, we talked about uh, also in, in situations where you have uh, drug shortages and uh, ventilator shortages, uh, being able to get patients off the ventilator as soon as possible is helpful. And you, we prefer to avoid having patients on uh, standing uh, high doses of benzodiazepines that will then take uh, days to clear from their system once their lungs start to recover. So it's important to start weaning and start spontaneous awakening trials as patients' lungs are starting to recover. Move next to talking about delirium. Again, trying to differentiate delirium from agitation. So the DSM-5 defines delirium as a disturbance in attention, awareness, or cognition that develops over hours to days and fluctuates over the course of the day. It's being caused by a medical condition, substance intoxication or withdrawal, or a medication side effect. We differentiate hypoactive delirium from hyperactive delirium, which is really delirium associated with agitation. And just as we use uh, something like the behavioral pain scale to monitor pain and the RAS scale to monitor agitation, we can use something like a CAM scale to, or the CAM ICU scale to monitor for delirium in the ICU. Um, and so these algorithms are, are easily available online, but having an objective way to determine whether or not your patient is, is actually delirious can be very, very helpful in, in guiding your management. So we know that delirium occurs in about 50% of all ICU patients, and that's probably higher in patients with COVID-19. Patients who have delirium have significantly longer durations of mechanical ventilation and longer hospital lengths of stay. Patients who develop delirium in the ICU are at significant risk of both short-term and long-term cognitive deficits as well as a threefold increase in six month mortality. There are a number of non-modifiable risk factors, including age, dementia, and illness severity, and a few uh, important modifiable risk factors, including benzodiazepine use, blood transfusions, and steroid use, um, which is uh, a, a significant consideration in ICU patients with COVID-19. Um, so the PADIS guidelines, highlighted there are no effective medications to prevent ICU delirium, 
antipsychotics, dexmedetomidine, uh, statins and ketamine have all been researched without uh, evidence in, in terms of ICU delirium prevention. There are also no effective medications to treat ICU delirium. Um, the, the medications that we discussed really are helpful in decreasing agitation, which can be important for patient safety, allowing patients to tolerate ICU care, but that's not going to affect their delirium progression per se. And the one exception to that is that there is uh, good evidence to show that dexmedetomidine is effective for short-term uh, management of agitated delirium or hyperactive delirium that precludes ventilator weeding and extubation. And so in our setting, we often will put a patient on dexmedetomidine for a few hours or even a day to help to facilitate extubation, and then wean that back off once the patient is extubated. And we know that the, the process of being mechanically ventilated itself can result in significant uh, agitation. And so often patients' level of agitation will decrease once they're extubated. Um, what, what the uh, PADIS guidelines do recommend is using a multi-component approach for preventing and treating ICU delay. This includes re reorientation and cognitive stimulation, optimizing sleep and minimizing nighttime light and noise, uh, managing analgesia and minimizing sedation, using spontaneous awakening trials and spontaneous breathing trials, early exercise and mobility, using things like eyeglasses and hearing aids to help to keep patients oriented, um, and when possible, ha uh, having families engaged in, in the care of critically ill patients. SCCM summarizes this in the ICU Dr. Yahya, please, uh, please mute yourself if you don't mind. Thank you. I have a meeting. Thank you. Great. Thank so you. Much. No problem. Um, so SCCM summarizes these in the ABCDEF bundle. These, uh, there are a number of resources available on the SCCM website to go through recommendations of how to accomplish this in your ICU. And implementation of this bundle has been shown to significantly uh, decrease the ICU length of stay and hospital length of stay and decrease the risk of death in critically ill patients. Um, and so the more uh, components of the ABCDEF bundle that were implemented, the shorter the ICU and hospital length of stay and the lower the, the risk of death. Now, in, uh, during the COVID pandemic, we know that uh, delirium is very common in COVID-19 patients. And we know that optimal delirium prevention and delirium management really requires a highly skilled nursing staff. Um, and this is a challenge because having nursing and family present at the bedside uh, is very challenging uh, because of the infection uh, considerations around COVID-19. We also know that medications that we commonly use to treat delirium for, or medications that are commonly associated with increased delirium in critically ill patients like benzodiazepines and steroids are often uh, necessary for safe management of, of COVID-19 patients. And so being, being cognizant that patients are at very high risk of developing delirium and that whatever we can do in terms of those non-pharmacologic environmental uh, interventions can be very helpful in minimizing the development of delirium um, and helping our patients to have a good long-term recovery. The two other uh, components of the PADIS bundle that, uh, that are included, we'll touch on very quickly. One is immobility. Um, immobility is um, patients who have prolonged immobilization are at high risk of ICU-acquired weakness. It occurs in between a quarter and a half of all critically ill patients. It's associated with worse long-term outcomes and increased uh, pain. Uh, we also think that immobility may be a risk factor for delirium development. And so early interventions uh, to mobilize patients and begin early re rehabilitation are feasible, safe, beneficial, and cost-effective in resource-rich settings. Um, and these are not necessarily contraindicated in patients who have a stable mechanical ventilation or vasoactive uh, requirement. However, there's a lot less data to support uh, early mobilization and rehabilitation interventions in resource poor settings. And all of these interventions uh, can be very resource intensive and pre uh, present unique challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, 
we rely very heavily on physical therapists and occupational therapists uh, for, for these uh, efforts in the US and those professions are not always as well developed or well supported in uh, low and middle income countries. Um, that said, early mobilization may be especially important for patients with COVID-19 who may be intubated and immobilized for, for many days or even weeks, uh, especially in settings where outpatient rehabilitation infrastructure is, is not well developed. Um, and so developing a protocol for uh, early mobilization, at least range of motion exercises with patients who are, are in bed who are able to engage um, may, be, may be helpful in decreasing patients ICU length of stay and rehabilitation needs. That said, these are not safe or effective in patients with severe or worsening respiratory failure. Um, and finally, uh, when family assistants are, are uh, able to be present at the bedside, this is a great task to delegate to them uh, because with, with a little bit of education, often families are able to help their, their uh, ill loved ones to uh, to do some of those exercises and to maintain muscle mass. And then finally, sleep disturbances. Um, we know that decreased sleep quality is very common in critically ill patients. This is a modifiable risk factor associated with delirium and impaired recovery. Um, unfortunately, there are no recommended pharmacologic interventions. Um, and so really, we focus on improving sleep quality with inter environmental interventions. Um, so in mechanically ventilated patients, putting them on assist control can help them to get better rest at night, even if they're able to tolerate pressure support during the day. Um, reducing noise and light um, by keeping the lights off in the unit as possible. Um, encouraging the nurses to, to avoid uh, interruptions and stimulating medications. Uh, using eye plug, uh, earplugs and eye shades at night um, are all interventions that can help to improve a patient's sleep quality while in the ICU. And these are all things that are easy to accomplish and great targets for quality improvement in, in ICUs, even in resource poor settings. Very, very quickly, I'm just gonna mention neuromuscular blockade um, as one of the interventions that we commonly use for patients with very severe uh, uh, ARDS and severe hepatic respiratory failure. Um, it may work by improving chest wall compliance, reducing patient ventilator to synchrony, reducing metabolic demand and resulting in less oxygen demand in patients with severe hypoxemic respiratory failure, facilitating lung recruitment, and then by decreasing lung and systemic inflammation. We think that it may be effective in ARDS and, and have extrapolated that it may be effective in COVID-19 patients as well. Um, although we really don't have great data to support neuromuscular blockade for COVID-19 yet, but in a patient who's uh, has uh, severe hypoxemic respiratory failure, I think is definitely a, a reasonable uh, intervention to consider. The, the recommendations for COVID-19 from the ARDSnet group really come from the uh, ACURASYS trial in 2010. And this was comparing uh, neuromuscular blockade to deep sedation and showing the patients who underwent neuromuscular blockade had about a 40% decreased risk of uh, mortality. Uh, this was followed up by the ROSE trial from last year. Um, it's a little bit of a busy trial, but uh, a little bit of a busy diagram here, but um, looking at the top set of lines, there's really uh, no improvement in, in hospital survival to discharge in patients who underwent neuromuscular blockade. And, uh, sorry, um, no increase in survival to hospital discharge and no increase in patients who were discharged home. Um, so really showing no, no significant therapeutic benefit with uh, neuromuscular blockade at all. This isn't because they were using different uh, paralytic regimens. This is really because of the control groups that they were comparing with. And so comparing deep sedation in the acuresis trial versus light sedation in the ROSE trial. What I take away from this is that if you have a patient who's tolerating mechanical ventilation with light sedation, then you're probably not getting any additional benefit from neuromuscular blockade but in patients with significant agitation or dyssynchrony who are requiring deep sedation, the addition of neuromuscular blockade may well help to increase that patient's chances of survival. So studies only support early and limited use for about 24 hours. This is really most appropriate with patients with severe hypoxemia, dyssynchrony, or poor lung compliance. 
it's crucial that you ensure that your patient is well sedated prior to administering neuromuscular blockade and you do not wean sedation while the patient is paralyzed because you could end up with a awake and paralyzed patient, which could be very traumatic for the patient and uh, very, very high risk of those patients developing PTSD. Um, the, the need for, neuro, uh, for neurologic monitoring, like this monitoring for patients who were paralyzed is unclear. Neither the Acuracis or ROSE trial used uh, neurologic monitoring, um, although it is something that some anesthetists do prefer to do if that, that's a resource that you have available. Um, and then finally, bolus dosing may be safer and more effective than continuous effusions, both because it allows you to, to get a better assess, assessment of how much benefit the patient is getting from neuromuscular blockade, um, and because you, you have a better sense of how patients are going to clear their paralytic uh, based on their hepatic and renal function uh, as, as those medications clear from their system. So uh, serial boluses of, of neuromuscular blockade may be the, the safest way of, of achieving that therapeutic goal, especially in resource-poor settings for patients with COVID-19. So in summary, over the last uh, 45 minutes, we've gone over principles of analgesia and sedation for ICU patients, strategies for delirium prevention and management, uh, the role of immobility and sleep disturbance in, in the ICU and contributing to patient outcomes. Uh, we talked a little bit about neuromuscular blockade, and then hopefully we're able to adapt to how these principles relate in low and middle income uh, ICU practice, low and middle income country uh, practice and during the COVID pandemic. So thank you all for your time and your attention. I hope that this has been uh, interesting and informative for you. Please feel free to, to uh, ask 